Hey everybody, Rick McDonnell here, and I am gonna be doing my January reading wrap up today. But before we get to that, I just wanted to say uh, a quick little thing here about a podcast that I appeared on this week. I actually recorded it back in October, but it's the first episode of this new season of the podcast called The Bookshop Chronicles. And we had just the loveliest 40 minute conversation about all the books that we read in 2020 and what it was like reading in the pandemic. But yeah, it was tons of fun and Brandy is just like the sweetest person in the world. So if you don't get enough of my voice talking about books here on, uh, here on BookTube, there's a 45 minute podcast link down in the description box below. So go nuts. So today we're gonna talk about all the books that I finished in January. I think I have eight books to talk about today, plus two kind of deluxe size, large graphic novels. So lots to get to, so let's go. The first book that I read to kick off the year was Writers and Lovers by Lily King. I was a huge fan of Lily King's book, Euphoria. So I came into this one with the bar just so high and I probably only got to about here. As I expected, the strong suit of the book is King's writing. She's just a beautiful writer. There were quite a few like really moving passages in this book, but while the book is told well enough, I felt like the whole thing came off a little inconsequential. I don't like the conceit of fictional characters trying to publish a fictional story. I personally don't enjoy books about 30 something women trying to decide precisely which kind of man is going to disappoint them next. From the women I've talked to who've read this book, the book rings incredibly true to them. And it's the kind of book that bounces back your own experience and and it's interesting that way. But I don't have that experience and I never will. So it doesn't land the same way with me as it will land with other people. Other people found this story very cathartic. I didn't. But that's okay. Like, I'm not the person who's supposed to find this story cathartic. But I will say, Casey, the main character of this book, I quite liked. I liked her voice quite a bit. She had a sense of vulnerability that I thought was quite interesting. But at the end of the day, I felt like I was watching like a really good actor in like a so-so play. So next is my first five-star read of the year. And man, was this a doozy. Uh, it's Disgraced by J.M. Coetzee. Like, my word, this novel is tough sledding. Like, not in terms of quality, but in terms of content and trauma. Like it is intense and it is complicated, but as like a reading experience, it's as good as you will ever find. No part of this book is easy, but it is just like so shockingly readable. I'm not gonna talk about this book too much right here because I read it for my top 125 novels of all time project. So I'll do a real like deep dive review of this book soon. But what I will say now is that I'm positive this is a book that I'm gonna reread several times throughout my life. This is a book that people will be reading and rereading and rereading for 50 years. I, I have zero doubt about that. However, I would never tell you that this is required reading. There are too many triggers, way too many triggers in this book with violence and especially sexual violence. So if you have triggers for either of those things, absolutely skip this book, it's not for you. Next is a book that could not be further from disgrace and that is Star Wars Light of the Jedi. This story takes place like 200 years before any of the movies. So in this new kind of Disney era of Star Wars, this is the first true starting point where they just had a clean slate. There could just be way more surprises doing a story this way and there are. Like I was predisposed to liking this book because I'm just such a massive Star Wars fan, but I didn't expect to like this book this much. This book is very much just kind of setting the table for this era and it does so perfectly. Like it feels like it has all the elements of a really good prequel story, but with the immediacy and power and stakes of a current story. It's really, really diverse just in terms of aliens and also just human beings. Like there are people of all different colors and shapes and sizes and backgrounds and creeds and sexual identities, it's just, it's really interesting and diverse and doesn't like make a huge deal out of it. It's just like, these are people. We're writing stories about people. And I'm just so excited for the kids who are getting into Star Wars at this time. It has some like really cool, like philosophical discussions about the force and how the force works and how the force is supposed to be used or should be used. It just really makes me wanna check out everything that happens 
with the rest of this era. I gave this book four and a half out of five stars. Like it was that good. Like for what it is, it's that good. The next book has a little bit of local flavor. It's called The Wheaton by Joanne Jackson. This is put out by Stonehouse Publishing here in Edmonton. It's about a man named John Davies who, whose wife dies in her 60s. And he kind of falls into a job at an elderly, like long-term care facility. And it's about him kind of stepping out into this world without the safety net that is his wife. It's about him confronting mortality in ways that he wasn't prepared for. It's his wife's death did not sit with him well at all. And I don't think he really knew how to take it. So him working at this home ends up being the place that gives him the tools to process all of that. I loved it specifically because my brother works at a long-term care facility for the elderly and it just it was such an interesting window into the life that he lives like he he works in a in a much more hands-on intense role than what John does in this book but just the idea of like my brother being around that kind of pain and that much death that amount of just like uncertain circumstance like a home that's dedicated to people who are, are basically kind of on their last leg and they're all kind of just waiting to die. Like that's what you're there for. It's like, it's such a heavy place to be and it just gave me such newfound respect for what he goes through and processes and has to take home and live through on a daily basis. Like my brother, it, th there's a line in the book that talks about the people who work in these facilities. They can do that because they're people that have the ability to project themselves into the future and know that they're going to be like that someday and how would they want to be treated in that scenario and then they're able to take that and, and, and give that back to those people where my brother is different from that he spent his entire 20s very very sick he basically lived the life of an elderly person uh, in his 20s couldn't really leave the house couldn't do much didn't have a job for over a decade and he's now kind of in his late 30s and he's gotten through all of that and he's kind of gotten his life back and he's gotten a, a life for the first time in adulthood and just to have seen him go through all of that and then to see my brother kind of choose to spend the rest of his life in an act of service to other people it, it's just it's such a special thing that he's doing and this shouldn't get him bonus points but it kind of does unfortunately in our society the fact that he's a young man who chooses to um, give of himself like that. That doesn't happen very often. It should happen a lot more than it does. So that was just like, that was such a beautiful side effect of reading this book. All right, the next book is Hunger by Roxane Gay. And this is going to be kind of difficult to talk about because I feel like this is a book that is beyond criticism. Talking about this book in, in kind of like a book review kind of way is so silly to me. And that's because a book like this is entirely about its content, it's entirely about its message. So reviewing it in terms of like a piece of art, reviewing it in terms of like a star rating is so strange to me and I'm basically going to refuse to do that. Or at least if we talk about this book, we have to talk about it in terms of the book as an encapsulation of a message, the book as an encapsulation of something that is being put out into society that needed to be put out there. And then there is hunger as a memoir, as a piece of art. Like you can talk about the two things, but you have to talk about them separately, I think. Uh, I couldn't have been more affected by this book. Jackie and I have a family friend who unfortunately went through some, some things extremely similar to Roxane Gay, if as insane as it is to compare, but like Roxane Gay, but even crazier. And those events have affected her in very, very, very similar ways. And I remember what it was like hearing her story from her and kind of going through that and just being just so profoundly affected by this idea of how trauma can manifest itself in your body and how you can use, especially as a woman, use your body as a, as a literal shield against aggressive, domineering, hateful, destructive men. And, and to, to, change your body as a defense mechanism and then have that defense mechanism essentially then attack you for the rest of your life and have all these negative connotations and 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 these negative effects just to your health like it like it's just tragic from start to finish and i'm i'm so glad that she wrote this and put that out there because i think it will allow some people to see bodies as stories because that's what they are. Like some people just don't take care of themselves and they look a certain way. But whether you are 250 pounds overweight or whether you are 
50 pounds underweight. Like the story of your life contributed to the way that you look. There's genetics and there's experience and anxieties and depression and all of these exterior things just that, that, that get put on top of you that affect and shape and change the way you physically look. And I feel like that conversation wasn't really happening at least you know, culturally at large until this book came out. So I just, I just could not be more thankful that she wrote it. But then if you look at it as a piece of art, I think it was fine. I may have been a bit let down. It's the first like long form piece I've ever read from Roxane Gay. And this is gonna sound worse than I mean it to, but it, it comes off to me like a really well articulated confessional series of blogs. And that word will have negative connotations for some people, especially like serious writers. I don't mean it negatively at all. I'm just talking about in terms of a form and a style. The one thing about the book that sort of rubbed me the wrong way is 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 how sometimes it felt like it was it was her giving a dramatic reading of her own trauma. Just the way she structures some chapters, uh you can tell that she knows where the beats are. You can tell she knows where like oh this is where I I hit home the really tra traumatic thing and then I hold for applause. Like there's these moments where she's just like, that's when I knew my whole life changed. New paragraph. That's the day I was raped, period. End of chapter. You can hear the like, dong, like dramatic tones that like a documentary would put over top of it. It's just like, I don't know. It, it, it in no way hampered my enjoyment of the book. I just thought it was so weird. The, weirdly, the best way I can describe my feeling with the actual writing of the book. A friend of mine got an advanced copy of a book that's coming out in February. It's called Kink. It's an anthology book about uh, sex and kink and all that kind of stuff. And Roxanne Gay has a story in it. And my friend Rachel, she has an advanced reading copy of it. And a couple weeks ago on Twitter, she just, she tweeted out like how surprised she was at how bad she thought Roxanne Gay's story was in that anthology. And after reading this book, I'm like, I I wouldn't be surprised about that at all. I feel like a lot of the success or gravitas, everything that's kind of impressive about this book to me was her story and what she was saying and her message. She communicates her message extremely well, but in terms of like a writer and prose and pacing and character and all these sorts of things, like this book didn't show me any of that stuff. This was like a five-star book, I'll say that. But it's not one of those five-star books where you're like, oh, I would read everything that this author ever produced. Because to me, it was more about the message. It was more about what she was saying, not how she was saying it. The next book I'm gonna talk about was a book I listened to on audio. And that is The Mercies by, I always forget the name, uh, Kieran Millwood Hargrave. This is a story that happens in the early 1600s in a Nordic village where all the men are out fishing and there's this huge kind of natural disaster. You know, most of or all the men die and the village essentially becomes a village of all women. And then later on in the story, there's this man, Absalom, comes from Scotland with his Norwegian wife. In Scotland, he burned witches. And then he comes to this village of Vardo, it's called, and sees kind of his greatest fear, a town completely made up of independent functioning women. So naturally, he sees this as a place kind of condemned by God, unnatural, evil, and it must be extinguished. The book was good. I really wish I didn't listen to it on audio though. I feel like it's not the, the right medium for it. I was really excited about it because I quite like the narrator's voice and she has kind of the right accent. So I thought it was going to be really atmospheric and she was going to be like the perfect narrator to tell this story. And she was good, but there was, I can't even put my finger on it. There was just something about it that was lacking where it just didn't propel you. It didn't have the pace to kind of keep me interested in the story. And maybe it's the story itself. I just can't say that for sure because I think the voice also contributed to that. There was just something kind of bland about it. The delivery was kind of dispassionate. I would give the book kind of a three out of five stars, but if I read it on paper, I could see it being better. Like I was more interested getting into this book because I wanted to read more about Vardo as this community of independent women. I thought that was so cool. And especially at that time, that's such an interesting concept for a book, but it almost jumps entirely over that time period. Then all of a sudden Absalom comes, it's three years later, and it's, it's about men coming into the town to try to destroy what they've built. 
rather than them building what they built. If you're more interested in that side of it, you'll probably like the story more than I did, but I, it just wasn't telling the exact story that I was going in wanting to hear about. Next, I wanna talk about two deluxe graphic novels that just blew my mind this month. It is Descender by Jeff Lemire. It's the complete collection of that series, and holy shit, is it good. This is a story told over 32 issues of kind of a far off futuristic society that happens in this like series of nine planets. Years ago, like 10 years ago before the story starts, this giant race of machines show up and eradicate millions and billions of, of humans and then they leave. So then humans who have, who have built this society based on uh, machinery and androids and these sorts of things, they kind of turn on them and, and realize like, oh, we have to keep the machines down because they, you know, they could attack us and kill us at any moment. So humans instantly, their relationship to machines changes. Humanity just decides to destroy most of its artificial life. There's a little um, android boy named Tim21. He lives on this colony with his best friend who's a, a, like a 10 year old boy and his mother, they work in this mine, but there's a disaster that happens in the mine. It has to be evacuated, they all have to leave, and Tim21 unfortunately gets left behind. So he's basically left alone on this mining colony for 10 years. Events happen where Tim is pulled into this giant galactic story that happens in this book. The machine race that destroyed uh, such a huge chunk of humanity is, is coming back, and Tim's programming, somehow has the key to stopping them all. So that's kind of the frame of the story. There's just like this really intriguing kind of elegiac, bittersweet tone to the whole thing where you just, you can feel from the start, this isn't gonna quite go where you think it's gonna go. And it doesn't get wrapped up in this neat and tidy bow. It's this giant space opera that's really fun, but it's also really sad. And this little boy, Tim21, is just gonna break your heart. By the end, it has some really, really interesting philosophical questions about humans and our relation to androids. And in this story, you're kind of coming at it from a human perspective, but by the end, you're asked to ask, you know, to ask yourself, like, does your opinion of this change if you realize that the machines were actually there first and they ushered humanity into the story and then humans turned on them. And that's where the relationship changed. So they, they, it adds these really interesting wrinkles. And then by the end, there's kind of hints of magic that are happening. I don't wanna to say too much because there's a lot that you can give away and I don't wanna spoil too much, but if you're a graphic novel fan, if you're a fan of Saga, I think you would love this. If you're a fan of Mass Effect as a series, I think you would love this. It's just, it's so good. If you're, yeah, if you're a fan of space opera and, and big sci-fi stories, it's great. So the last book I'm gonna talk about as the, the sun officially kind of goes down around me, um, I read The Dragon Ball Chair by Tad Williams and it's a book I've been talking about on my channel all month. I've just been so delighted at the people who've kind of come along and who are falling into it and are, I think, sinking, by the end of the first book, finally sinking into what Tad Williams is doing and how important I think he is. And I think they're just like scraping the surface of how good this series gets. I don't think I've finished the series start to finish in a decade, actually. I was thinking about this the other day. At a certain point in my adult life, I just stopped having the ability to read through big, like giant series of books. So I'm just so excited to finally get to the end of the story again. I feel like I'm gonna be reading it for the first time. Yeah, I'm so giddy. Anytime, I said this um, to my friend Rebecca the other day, anytime anyone says anything nice about these books as they're reading them with me, my Grinch heart grows three sizes. I just get so excited. It feels like I wrote the books and people are complimenting me. That's how personal a relationship I have with these books. It just seems strange to me that I'm so emotionally connected to something that I didn't make. It's so weird. So thank you so much for watching. For everyone who's come to my channel in the last week or so through the booktube spin, I've made a lot of new friends in the last little while. I've got a bunch of new subscribers, so it's so exciting to see people accept this idea and pick it up and run with it. And it was way bigger and more expansive in the community than I ever expected for this first go around. I thought I would have to do three or four of these before it really got momentum. But like, 
straight away. People have really loved this idea and uh, everyone's having a lot of fun with it. So thank you so much for enjoying it and kind of indulging me. And I'm, I'm so glad people think it's as fun as I think it is. And it's gotten so dark in here, it, it feels awkward. So I'm just gonna end this video. Thanks so much for watching. Again, my name is Rick McDonnell and I'll see you guys in a couple days. Bye.